Good evening and welcome to the legislative session for the Spokane City Council for October 25th. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Council President Beggs? Here. Council Member Burke? Here. Council Member Cathcart? Present. Council Member Kinnear? Present. Council Member Mum? Here. Council Member Stratton? Here. Council Member Wilkerson? Present. Let the record re reflect that all council members are present. All right, we have two proclamations this evening. Uh, the first is for healthcare workers, Appreciation Month, and Lori Kinnear is going to read that. And she's joined by Rupert Salmon. Thank you. And welcome, Rupert Salmon. Whereas healthcare officials to include all levels of staffing at each hospital, every healthcare center and every emergency medical response team in our community have proven during the COVID-19 health pandemic to be more than just essential workers, but frontline heroes. And whereas throughout this pandemic, our healthcare workers have shared their stories of stress and exhaustion from caring for our community members and saving lives. And the dedication and fortitude of these devoted individuals to continue administering services is an inspiration to all. And whereas He's Alive Television is producing a 10-part program called Holding the Line, focusing on healthcare workers and the challenges they have faced throughout the pandemic and invites our community to join them in recognizing, honoring, and supporting our healthcare workers for their efforts throughout the pandemic. Now, therefore, Nadine Woodward, Mayor of the City of Spokane, on behalf of the citizens of Spokane, do hereby proclaim November 2021 as Healthcare Workers Appreciation Month in Spokane and call upon our community to observe this month by supporting and recognizing the healthcare workers and their families for their efforts to make Spokane a safe, and healthy place to live. And Rupert, I would love if you would um, say a few words for us. Uh, Mr. Salmon, are you there? We see your Square and name on the screen, but we're not hearing you. All right. Well, let's move on to the next proclamation, and then if Mr. Salmon becomes available, we'll let him speak then. Uh, so the next one is for Family Court Awareness Month, and Councilmember Mum. Joined by Kim Stadler. Thank you. This is Family Court Awareness Month. And whereas the mission at One Mom's Battle and Family Court Awareness Month Committee is to increase awareness on the importance of a family court system that prioritizes child safety and acts in the best interest of children. And whereas the FCAMC is committed to increasing awareness about the importance of education and training on domestic violence prevention, childhood trauma prevention, and post-separation abuse prevention for all professionals working within the family court system, and to educate judges and other family court professionals on the empirical data and research that is currently available in order to ensure decisions are in the best interest of children. And whereas the mission of the SCAMC is fueled by the desire for awareness and change in the family court system in honor of the nearly 800 children who have been murdered nationwide by separating or divorcing parents since 2008. Now, therefore, Nadine Woodward, the mayor of the city of Spokane, on behalf of the citizens of Spokane, does hereby proclaim November 2021 as Family Court Awareness Month in Spokane and encourages all citizens to be supportive of the SE AMC's mission. And I believe we have Tina here to accept the proclamation. Tina Swithin. Um, Kim Stadler. Hi, Tina. Oh, excuse me, I had a different name, I apologize. 
Hi, Kim. Welcome. Would you like to say a few words? Yeah, I, I prepared a small statement. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity. My name is Kim, and I am a volunteer with the Family Court Awareness Committee. I entered into the family court system naively believing that child safety and well-being was prioritized. What we have experienced has been very different than what we expected. Most would be shocked to know that in most states, family court judges can sit on the bench with zero training in childhood trauma or domestic violence. Domestic violence is about power and control. The desire to maintain power and control does not mysteriously vanish when a relationship ends. Instead, the children become the weapons and the court system becomes the platform. The first step to creating change is awareness, and I believe that this is a movement whose time has come. This is the next Me Too. This is the next Me Too movement. It's, it's Me Too Family Court. I am grateful to the city of Spokane, Washington, for joining almost 150 cities counties and states that have proclaimed November is Family Court Awareness Month. Thank you for standing with us to recognize the seriousness of post-separation abuse and the importance of having a family court system that is trauma-informed and prioritizes safety. Our children's lives are literally depending on the courts becoming educated in these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Tim, for such a personal um comment and for those of you who haven't accessed it if you do have access to netflix one of the top trending shows right now is called made which really ad addresses and identifies exactly what you're talking about and i think if people watch that they'll have a further understanding thank you for sharing you're welcome thank you and uh can i ask a quick question yeah, yeah. Hey, Kim, if, if somebody wanted to get more information on resources and just to learn more about this, who would they contact? Well, there is um, there's Family Court Awareness Month. There is a website. I can send it to you. Um, I don't want to get it wrong. I, it, I think okay. it's called separationabuse.com. There's a few, but I can send it to you. Okay, that would be great. It's Karen Stratton. Karen Stratton. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you again, Kim. And then Mr. Salmon, if you're there, we'll try you one more time. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome. Great. Great, great. Yes, I just want to thank you for this opportunity. Our TV station would, uh, using this opportunity to be a blessing in our community. Um, my wife, who is an ICU nurse for 30 years, over the last two years, we've just heard so much as she came home with all of the things that's going on in the hospital. And it just drove us to say, we need to do something to thank all of these healthcare workers for all of the stress and the grief in some cases that they're dealing with. So we want to use this opportunity to get the community and the country behind us in standing up and just saying thank you uh, because of all that they have been through. And I think this is something that we all need to take the time and just say, you know, look up and say, look what they have done. They have worked with our families. They've helped to save lives. And what can we do to just say, you know, thank you in, in, a, in a very tangible way? All right. Thank you. All right, Thank now you. we'll turn to our legislative agenda. Madam Clerk. Resolution 2021-86, revising the school zone speed schedule. And I believe uh, Inga Note is here to just tee this up. Sorry, I'm here. I'm trying to get the screen up. Yeah. Do we have any testimony for this? Probably not. Um, I don't have the ability to share, though. Uh, we'll see if we can.
working on that. There it is. Okay. It's not letting me do a screen share. All right. Working on it again. Yeah, the only option I have is to share file or whiteboard. It won't let me share my screen. All right. Here we go. Okay, so this is just an update of um, a resolution updating our school speed schedule. Um, the changes we're making are new middle school zones, um, adding a new school zone to G Prep, and then updating the boundaries of some existing locations where we had 21 flashing units installed. Uh, there's an Exhibit A that's attached to the resolution, and that just spells out all of the school zones in the city, including the existing ones and the ones that are being modified. The new ones are Denny Yasuhara Middle School, and then for Pauline Slett, which is the middle school um, that's under construction in the northwest part of the school, or of the city. Sacagawea, which is going to have a new zone on the west side of the school, and then the Gonzaga prep zone. And that's all I have. Okay. Let me check. We're just getting the signups. Any? Okay. So there's no requested community testimony for updating the speed zones around these new schools or new construction. Uh, any council commentary? Council member Mum. Obviously we need these, um, but I also, when I was seeing some of the pictures, because these are um, in a little bit different locations, I just hope that the uh, traffic calming committee, which has been on hiatus for quite some time can take uh, these locations under their wing, I'm not seeing some great connectivity there and we need some separated sidewalks and um, just make sure that we're making it safe right adjacent to these schools um, for the students walking and possibly even reviewing all the crosswalks as well um, because it's a really important component and we all know how busy it gets around these schools. Thank you. Any other council commentary? All right, we'll have a roll call. Council Member Mum. Aye. Council Member Stratton. Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Aye. Council President Sinai. Council Member Burke. Aye. Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. All right, that passes seven to zero. And next, I'm going to go just slightly out of order and take two uh, resolutions in support of settlements, if you want to read 88. Okay. Resolution 2021-88, approving settlement of Stephen Kessler arising out of an incident occurring on May 9, 2019 in the city of Spokane as more fully described in the claim for damages, $60,000. Right. And checking with my producer, no we do have one requested testimony on that. Nicolette Ockeltree, if you're here, if you want to hit star three. Welcome to City Council, Nicolette. You have up to three minutes. Thank you, and good evening, Council. Barring any legal reasons obligating Council or the City to do otherwise, I believe a short description of the claim against the city or a copy of the claim itself ought to be included and made readily available to citizens without them having to file a public records request to access information about the claim or incident. 
To do so would greatly improve transparency on these matters and lessen the burden on the clerk's office responding to public records requests. Moreover, public records requests often take at least 30 days to receive an installment, and considering council agendas are usually only available about a week or two at most in advance, it practically renders making such a request for the purposes of giving testimony useless, since one would not receive those records until council had already voted on these matters. Please consider including this kind of description in on the agenda itself. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And any council commentary? Council Member Cathcart. Yeah, I, I'll be supporting this tonight. I just uh, would agree with what Nicolette said. I think once we've come to a resolution and settled these, uh, we should make it available for the public to read, especially as we're preparing to vote so that they can weigh in if there's anything to weigh in on. So just wanted to share my, my support for what she was sharing. Thank you. Any other commentary? All right, seeing and hearing none, we'll go to a vote. Roll call. Uh, Council Member Mum. Aye. Council Member Stratton. Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Aye. Council President Tanai. Council Member Burke. Aye. Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. All right, that passes seven to zero. Next resolution. Resolution 2021-89, approving settlement of Aaron Stacing, arising out of an incident occurring June 30, 2019 in the city of Spokane, as more fully described in the claim for damages, $62,500. Right. Any community testimony on that, Mr. Bird? No, no community testimony on that. Any um, further council commentary? All right, we'll have a roll call. Council Member Mum. Aye. Council Member Stratton. Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Aye. Council President Tanai. Council Member Burke. Aye. Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. Okay, that passes seven to zero. And we'll go back to Resolution 87. Okay. Resolution 2021-87, adopting the City of Spokane Sustainability Action Plan. Right, we will have some community testimony on that. Um, but to just tee that up, um, this is a resolution that would uh, adopt the Sustainability Action Plan uh, that's been developed over the last couple of years. Um, Kara Odegaard, I think, is here. If you'd like to tee it up, Kara. Great, thank you. Uh, Jacoby was going to help with my slides. Okay. Well, good evening, council members and council president. Thank you for allowing me a few minutes to speak ahead of your vote on the resolution to adopt the sustainability action plan. Most of you are aware that the sustainability action subcommittee was created in 2019 for the purpose of recommending policies and actions that would help the city accomplish climate and sustainability goals set both by the state and by the city. From the beginning, council made it clear that they wanted a process that would encourage community participation and co-designing an update to the city's 20, 2009 sustainability action plan. For the past two and a half years, dozens of SAS members guided this community process where thousands of voices were heard. It's been extremely exciting. Um, it's been exciting for me to be part of this process. Over the course of the past few years, uh, the Sustainability Action Subcommittee reached out to and received feedback from dozens of local and regional agencies, community organizations, and institutions of higher education. This is not an exhaustive list, but it gives you an idea of the breadth of our community conversations. 
Most of the organizations listed here contributed to the sustainability plan and others have indicated that they're looking forward to partnering with the city in implementation. I am honored to be standing before you tonight alongside the amazing individuals who have contributed to the 2021 Sustainability Action Plan. These residents came into this city council process with the desire to participate in an open co-creation of our sustainability plan as you see it tonight, which provides a vision of what Spokane residents want to see in our future. Of all the work that I've done to date in my 25 year career, this project is the one that I am most proud of. I was born and raised here in Spokane like many of the other members of the SAS, but regardless of where these folks were born, they all call Spokane their home. I will end by quoting one of my favorite local authors, Jeff Walter, who says, quote, I think there are only two things you can do with your hometown look for ways to make it better or look for another place to live. Well, here are 58 people that have collectively spent thousands of hours finding ways to make Spokane better. And for that, I am truly grateful. Thank you for considering our recommended update to the city's sustainability action plan. Thank you. All right, we have a number of people from the community that would like to uh, provide some testimony on that. And again, um, if you haven't testified before us in the past, it's really important that you're listening on the phone and not uh, measuring things by the video feed because there is a pretty significant delay on that. So hope that you'll be on the line. I will um, ask you when it's your turn to press star three, which will raise your hand electronically. And then once I get confirmation that you're there, I'll invite you to testify. You'll have up to three minutes. I'm not gonna give time signals in the middle of it, but if you get to the end of three minutes, I will just ask you to finish up your last couple of words. And then I'll need you to hit star three and lower your hand. I need you to address your comments to me as the um, presiding officer for the meeting and not talk to other individual council members by name. And again, we try to keep everything respectful. Um, and uh, I think that's all. So first up is going to be uh, Brian Henning, followed by David Camp and then Kevin Coons. So Mr. Henning, if you could, okay, you're here. Um, welcome to city council, Brian. Um, you have up to three minutes. Council President Beggs, can you hear me? I can. Wonderful. Thank you for considering Resolution 87 to approve a new sustainability action plan. My name is Dr. Brian Henning. I'm Professor of Philosophy and of Environmental Studies at Gonzaga, where I'm Director of the Center for Climate, Society, and the Environment. Given the especially beautiful autumn weather we've been enjoying, it's just easy to forget just how difficult last summer was. Average daily temperatures were nine and a half degrees higher than normal, and combined with lower rainfall, we actually had the first exceptional drought for the first time in our history. Another half million acres of our beautiful forests in our state burned, leaving our air frequently unhealthy to breathe. More than 20 of our own citizens here in Spokane and more than 100 people across our state died due to the intense heat wave. How many ecosystems must be lost? How many people need to die before we treat this as urgent crisis that it is. For too long, Spokane's attitude toward climate change has been like a patient whose doctor tells them that if they don't lose weight and fast, they're likely to have a fatal heart attack. Realizing the seriousness of the situation, the patient pledges to lose weight, the weight by a certain date, and we even buy a new scale and dutifully record the results monthly. However, the pounds just aren't coming off. In fact, they keep going up. What's missing? A plan, of course. Without a plan, with specific strategies for eating healthier and getting exercise, pledging to lose weight is an empty gesture. Like this patient, for years and under multiple administrations, Spokane has steadfastly pledged to achieve specific targets to reduce heat trapping pollution by certain dates. It's also taken the time to periodically measure its progress in achieving those targets. But what it's never had is an actual plan with specific strategies to achieve its climate pollution reduction targets until now. 
This revised sustainability action plan is a common sense step to get our community on a healthier trajectory so we can continue to enjoy our beautiful Spokane region for generations to come. Of course, the real test does not come in approving the plan, which I implore you to do. Despite the years of effort, the plan is actually the easy part. The real test is whether we can marshal the will to transform our individual and collective habits, systems, and policies for a just and verdant world. I urge you and all of the council members not only to vote in favor of this Resolution 87, but to adopt the revised sustainable action plan and do everything in your power to implement it as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd like to invite David Camp to hit star three. All right. Mr. Camp, if you're there, you have up to three minutes. Um, all right. Mr. David Camp, if you're there, if you hit star three. All right, we'll go next to Kevin Coons and after him, Isaiah Payne. So Kevin Coons, if you're there, if you can hit star three. Can you hear me? Is this David? Yes, this is. I'm sorry for the trouble there. Yeah, no, we've got you. So you have up to three minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Council President Biggs. Um, I'm David Camp. I live on Five Mile. I own Camp Creative, a marketing services company. And I helped write the buildings and energy portion of the sustainability action plan. I urge you all to vote yes on the plan. As uh, Brian Henning just mentioned, we've just had a taste of what lies ahead. Uh, the Spokane River dried to a trickle this summer. In the valley, you could walk across the river without getting your feet wet. The heat killed hundreds in the region. It burned millions of acres. It cost hundreds of millions of dollars in economic losses and firefighting costs. Uh, four decades ago, I was a Forest Service firefighter. Since then, Northwest fires have exploded by more than a thousand percent in annual acreage burned. Science tells us our kids here will likely see temperatures above 120. To keep our city safe and healthy, attractive to business and to talent, please adopt the sustainability plan. Clean energy, buildings, and transportation are all within our means. Nothing in the plan is radical. Dozens of other cities already do all of this and more because making these investments is cheaper than not making them. This plan also tells the world that Spokane thinks ahead. We claim to be near nature and near perfect. Let's walk the walk and tell the world about it. Spokane's future is electric and urban, but we have a long way to go. My five mile neighborhood has thousands of homes, most of them in the city, but we have no bus service. Spokane streets remain deadly for bicycles. Home builders build in the sprawling suburban fringe, not in city neighborhoods where we need them. These are things this plan will help fix. Urbanization saves money, it saves the climate, and it builds a city that people want to live in. The global scientific consensus says we must cut fossil fuel use in half by 2030 and all together by 2050. The President of the United States and the President of the United Nations have declared this code red for humanity. So what a time to serve on the city council. <laughs> but you can make a difference, a larger difference here than any previous council ever has. So please, prepare Spokane for the clean electric urban future. Please pass this plan. Thank you. Thank you. And next, uh, Kevin Coons, and after him, Isaiah Payne, and then Nathan Lill. So Kevin, if you're there, if you want to hit star three. All right. Kevin, welcome to City Council. You have up to three minutes. Thank you, Council President. Uh, my name is Ke uh, Kevin Coons, co-founder of Aquaport Technology. Oops. Hello, can you 
Can you hear me okay? I, we lost you for a moment, but we can hear you now. Let's start over. Okay. Thank you, Council President. Uh, my name is Kevin Coons, co-founder of Aquaport Technologies. Uh, I was born and raised here in Spokane, just as many on the subcommittee. Climate change is a topic that requires a detailed focus on a myriad of complex issues. Our region's SAP is a mere 84 pages when compared to the entire planet's 1,300 pages represented in the sixth assessment of the IPCC report. I believe it is acceptable to be a potential elected city council member while not fully understanding the complexities of all issues related to climate. It is why the SAP is a plan, because the plans evolve over time. We all have different jobs with different specialties and passions. Having said that, my hope for future elected city council members is to embrace the change around climate, to focus on how our city can be more proactive rather than reactive when it comes to changing weather patterns. This requires an ear and an open mind. Listen to learn, but first we have to learn to listen. Dr. Brian Henning recently provided a climate change forum as part of Gonzaga's Climate Society and Environment. This forum was simply an open discussion to listen to candidates and their stance on climate change and other uh, pressing issues relevant to the job at stake. Despite the great opportunity to discuss an important topic affecting our region, only half the potentially elected officials were in attendance. We don't have time to ignore a topic that we do not understand. My request of you, uh, to you, those who remain holding their city council positions after November 2nd, is to fully embrace the 84 pages of the SAP and to help the newly elected officials in doing so as well. The bootleg fire in Oregon burned 413,000 acres this summer in 39 days. This was the largest fire in the country and it was in our backyard geographically. An inability to recognize our local weather pattern changes is simply not in the cards. I want to take a second to recognize the current city council members for their hard work recognizing the SAP. I would also like to recognize the work being done by our local 350 Spokane chapter and for the many volunteers hours put in by the subcommittee. The work done by these organizations has created an opportunity for our city to move forward with resiliency, mean, resiliency in mind. God bless and go Zags. I yield back. Thank you. Next, I'd like to invite Isaiah Payne to hit star three, followed by Nathan Lill and then Larry Luton. You're on mute. Oh, sorry. Next, I'd like to invite Isaiah Payne to hit star three, followed by Nathan Lill and then Larry Luton. So, Mr. Payne, if you're there. Isaiah, welcome to City Council. You have up to three minutes. Thank you, Council President. Mr. the Council, appreciate your time. Uh, three main concerns that uh, I, I want to raise. Uh, I have some questions and certainly don't expect immediate answers, but things to uh, certainly consider. Um, you know, the city in 2018 and yourself, Council President Begg, sponsoring an ordinance to establish a sustainability action committee tasked with putting together the sustainability action plan. Uh, it called for 11 voting members from different stakeholder groups. And uh, who are those 11 members? How did they vote on this plan? Uh, that has yet to be seen. Uh, do these members represent more than just one narrow ideological viewpoint? Also remains to be seen. Uh, these individuals are supposed to be nominated and appointed. Uh, I have yet to find where there is an ordinance or a motion from this council showing such action. Uh, which members hold which positions and what are their term lengths? Also, not information I could find. Uh, this committee is also supposed to consult with all city divisions to identify economic, regulatory, and technological challenges to include fiscal analysis in the plan. Again, things that are missing, things that are part of the ordinance that was passed by this body. And so what are we left with? How do we have a sustainability action plan when the committee doesn't exist, or if this plan does exist, then why didn't it follow the enumerated process that this body passed? Where did it come from? If this group is an unofficial group calling themselves the, the Sustainability Action Subcommittee, 
Why is it on the city website? Why was it supported by city staff? And if it is official, why didn't it follow the rules that this body set out? That's just concern about how the public can trust the city when the council isn't willing to abide by the rules that it created. Secondarily, there's a whole lot in this plan about housing. And I know you all recall that we just recently passed a housing action plan. Uh, the city engaged in this included, uh, I believe, 40 plus amendments after a broad base of stakeholders were consulted and involved in this process. Uh, very much unlike the sustainability plan that you see before you tonight. The question remains then, why is the council taking a second swipe at housing? Is the housing action plan not good enough? Uh, is the plan commission not capable enough to implement the directives already been given by this council? How are stakeholders in the future going to feel if the city isn't negotiating in good faith and then going back and taking a second swipe at an issue that has already been hotly contested and debated and brought to resolution? Why is the council mudding the waters and undermining previous directions to the plan commission? By the way, none of those have yet have been implemented to date. I do want to thank the council and those behind the document you see before you tonight for removing the ban on natural gas that was in the first draft plan. It's not wise to restrict energy choices for families in Spokane but to make housing more expensive and less, less safe in the extreme temperatures that you heard talked about already. However, I would urge this council to go a step further. You have the opportunity tonight to take a stand for true sustainability Mr. when it comes Mr. to Payne? our region's energy. Mr. Payne, you're over your time. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for spending thank you very some much. time with us. Um, and next, I would like to invite Nathan Lill to hit star three, followed by Larry Luton and Alice Groza. Um, are you there, Nathan Lowe? All right, not seeing Nathan. I'll invite Larry Luton to hit star three. All right, Larry, welcome to city council. You have up to three minutes. You there, Larry? If this is Nathan. All right. We'll, we'll take you, Nathan. You have up to three minutes. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Council. Thank you for, for giving me the opportunity to speak in support of the SAP and for the vision and the aspirational work that went into its creation. So my name is Nathan Lill. I'm an educator, a parent, and a proud citizen of Spokane. I was born and raised in the city, the first of the fourth generation of both Chinese American and Scandinavian immigrants. I was born two years after the expo in 74, which was the first environmentally themed world expo in history, hosted by the smallest city in its history. The picture above this live feed of this meeting is a testament to the audacity of urban revitalization and the impact of environmental policies that transformed economically and culturally the heart of our community. Spokane has a history of punching above its belt and has been a humble leader who inspires through action and example. The SAP is a continuation of a half century of work toward a better and more sustainable future for Spokane while giving overdue honor and respect to the sacred land and culture of the Spokane and Salish peoples who were displaced by history. In my estimation, the SAP before the council today is overdue. In this, I defer to my son and my daughter who have brought this to my attention. Today, I speak for them. As teenagers, they are wrought with the anxiety of seeing the effect of climate change and social injustice in real time, and the hopelessness of governmental, societal, and cultural apathy. My kids have a news cycle that is reminding them of irreparable damage, while they are also seeing an adult world with unconscionable inaction. The document is a template, and more than just a symbolic act of faith, 
This is a commitment. I believe strongly that the vision embodied by this proposal will be a powerful call to action for other cities in the inland Pacific Northwest, Washington State, and elsewhere, and to once again showcase that this city, as a humble leader, is moving towards a sustainable future. I would say that it is a moral obligation to adopt the SAP, but to our children, this is a matter of survival. Fifty years from now, we may all look back at this moment with reverence and pride and know that the origin of Spokane's sustainable, equitable, and just community began in a Zoom call. Thank you for your time and consideration and for taking action when it mattered for future generations. Thank you. And now I'd like to invite Larry Luton to hit star three, followed by Alice Groza and then Brian Burrow. Right. Uh, Larry, Thank welcome to City Council. And for taking action when it mattered for future generations. Um, you, someone's got yeah. their TV on. Are you there, Larry? Now I'd like to invite Larry Luton to hit star three, followed by all right. Um, Let's go to um, Alice Groza and Larry, if you're watching, make sure that you have your TV off and are listening on the phone, and that way you won't have the delay. But is Alice Groza there, star three? All right. Welcome, Alice. Hi. Yeah, can you hear me? I can. Welcome to City Council. You have up to three minutes. Okay. Um, so I am a senior at Lewis and Clark High School. I would just start, like to start out by saying thank you to Nathan and your testimony on behalf of the youth perspective of Spokane. That was obviously very reflective and we're obviously all feeling the same thing. Um, I got introduced to the Spokane Sustainability Action Plan in the spring, working with Elise Hochstadt and Kara Odegaard. And I just like to say that like the development of this plan is really inspiring for a lot of the youth action in Spokane, it's been really inspiring to see kind of like the concrete attainability of local legislation. And it would be really great for our region who is known for its outdoors and as a reflection of Washington and even the United States, be putting in such a forward thinking, specific, actionable plan and so obviously I'm speaking in support of this and kind of on behalf of there's a lot of youth climate legislation, climate action volunteering in Spokane and this kind of being one of the first steps and obviously many, we have a long journey ahead of us, but to just see this concrete action and get to know the people behind this plan and all the work they've put in with it. So I'm just kind of speaking on behalf of you know, kind of the use if there's no other here here tonight, but just seeing this implemented as kind of the generation that's carrying on this battle, but seeing this implemented, taken seriously, especially in a place like Spokane that can kind of be seen as the more right-leaning area of Washington, but taking on this progressive action is just really inspiring for future action and future attainability. So I just want to say... Thank you for considering this, and I hope on behalf of the youth of our region that you do vote yes, and thank you for all the hard work that went into this. All right. Thank you. I'm going to try Larry Luton again. Star three, Larry. All right. Are you there, Larry? Uh, okay, then I'll invite Brian Burrow to hit star three. Uh, 
All right. Is that you, Brian? Welcome to City Council. Hey, good evening. Uh, Brian Barr here from Really Clean Energy. Uh, yeah. We specialize in net zero emissions planning. Our engineers have uh, more than 30 years experience designing solutions to help clients reduce energy consumption and, uh, and produce renewable energy using the renewable resources around them. Uh, first, I want to say that uh, building a plan for sustainable community is a lot of work, so congratulations to Kara and the SAP team for all your hard work and long hours. Um, second, uh, while I appreciate the, the immense amount of effort that's put in, been put into this so far, uh, I'd suggest to the council that uh, the plan undergo some further evaluation and edits before being officially approved and adopted. Uh, the, the plan covers a very broad range of topics from uh, you know, trout habitats to uh, urban tree plans. And uh, while I support this uh, 100%, uh, the, the monumental task of transitioning off of the dirty fossil fuels and towards the, the beautiful utopia of a clean, green electric society that we're aiming towards uh, you know, there are a few gaps that I suggest taking a look at, such as the, the impact of uh, you know, the, the likely future natural gas ban in a region too cold for heat pumps full of old drafty houses, and uh, even more importantly, the uh, predicted 92% increase in electricity demand being delivered on the same power grid that currently crashes every time you know, we have a heat wave, uh, as, as was brought up earlier, or we get a winter storm uh, dropping trees on top of our power lines. Uh, the same grid would be providing an increased demand and uh, is certainly unprepared for it, but the SAP uh, doesn't quite address uh, that, that huge need ahead of us. Uh, as well as a more, more uh, time spent around the economic impact of uh, how will things look if the SAP is carried out, as well as how do we measure uh, progress along the way to tell if we're going to achieve uh, what we're setting out to achieve uh, along the way, because these, uh, these sustainability projects can be tens and hundreds of millions of dollars. and so having those benchmarks along the way to, uh, to gauge whether or not the uh, projects are going to achieve the intended outcome, uh, I'd say are incredibly important before we decide that we're going to head that path, uh, down that pathway. Thanks for your time this evening. Um, lastly, uh, my company was hired to do uh, a feasibility study on this topic. Um, I apologize that it wasn't made available sooner, but uh, it was published just recently, and so I imagine everyone will be getting a copy of that. Uh, and in there, it does point out some of the, some of the gaps, uh, as I suggested this evening, as well as uh, outlines a uh, viable pathway to achieve the net zero emissions targets ahead of us uh, without sacrificing resiliency or risking uh, huge prices, price increases, as we've seen in, uh, in the California markets that are really just a couple strides ahead of Washington in this effort. Uh, thanks for your time this evening. Thank you. And next, I'd like to invite Mercy Aguilar. Hit star three, and after Mercy will be Patrick McCormick, and then Chastity Kolb. Welcome to City Council, Mercy. You have up to three minutes. Thank you very much, City Council President Beggs. I would like to bring attention that um, we really are in need of garbage cans downtown in Spokane. Um, I know that we are speaking on the SAP today, but that will help alleviate a lot of the litter going into the river um, and just litter around our city. I'm really concerned that our EMS, our fire, our police officers um, are not wearing appropriate PPE at, uh, when they're on their shifts or when they are in Mercy, city vehicles. Mercy. It, yes. it seems like this is a, a bit of field of the plan. Do you want to be at open forum instead and talk about? Oh, yes. I thought we were at open forum. No. Um, yes, I do support the SAP. And, um, That's all right. I'm really excited That's all right. about the 100% renewable. Okay. So this is renewable if you want to talk any more about that. But I'll put you down for open forum. Open forum it is. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right, uh, next I'd like to invite Patrick McCormick to hit star three, followed by Chastity Kolb and then Trenton Miller. All right, Patrick, welcome to City Council. You have up to three minutes. Are you there, Patrick? All right. 
how about Chastity Kolb? Are you there? And if you want to hit star three, Chastity. All right. Chastity, welcome to City Council. You have up to three minutes. Hello, Council President Beggs. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Chastity Kolb, and I'm a resident of the city of Spokane, speaking on behalf of the Spokane Riverkeeper. I've been working with Spokane Riverkeeper to provide community outreach and education regarding the importance of water conservation for our river. I am here today to ask that the council pass the sustainability action plan. As you know, the sustainability action subcommittee has worked with city volunteers for two years engaging with the public to ensure this plan is inclusive and works to protect our natural resources, health, and livelihood of all Spokane residents for generations to come. I moved here from Virginia in 2017. In just over four years, I have witnessed the effects of climate change on this city. Wildfire smoke and very unhealthy air quality in the summer ground soaking rain in January, followed by a windstorm that took almost 200 trees from our city parks, leaving thousands without power. And this summer's extreme drought, dropping river flows lower than 97% of those recorded since 1891. All of these are signs that a strong plan is needed to address the impacts of climate change, which will be further compounded by future population growth. Our aquifer, the sole source of our drinking water, is tied to our river. That is why we need a strong water conservation goal of 25% over the next 10 years and drought response actions triggered by low flows in the Spokane River. Both of these actions will help maintain in-stream flows important for survival of native fish and the future efforts of the Upper Columbia tribes to restore salmon in the Spokane watershed. This plan also outlines strategies to improve and protect water quality, not only for Spokane, but for our tribal neighbors downstream. It proposes to build climate resilience, including restoration and protection of riparian and wetland habitats. And it promises to engage and collaborate with community partners in these efforts, promoting stewardship for the river and the greater watershed. Spokane Riverkeeper is here to advocate for the river, its tributaries, ecosystems, and all the benefits it provides for the people in our watershed. We ask that the City Council approve the Sustainability Action Plan as its strategies will place us on the right track to protect and sustain our precious water resources and the iconic river for which the city is known. Again, I thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Spokane River and its keepers. Thank you. Thank you. And next, I want to invite uh, Trenton Miller to hit star three. And when he's done, I'm going to try again for Larry Luton and Patrick McCormick. So be ready to hit star three on your phone if you two are still there. Trenton, welcome to City Council. You have up to three minutes. Are you there, Trenton? Are you there, Trenton? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay, hi. Uh, thank you, City Council, for giving me the opportunity to express my support for the adoption of the Sustainability Action Plan today. My name is Trenton Miller. I'm a resident of Spokane and a contributing member of the Sustainability Action Committee. Spokane faces a choice today. If we refuse to adopt the plan, then we are choosing to ignore the warnings that science and the planet are giving us about the reality of what our future in this region will be. We will be failing our future generations, letting them down and leaving to them a mess that they will be burdened with the task of cleaning up, if that is even still possible when their time comes. However, if we choose to adopt this plan, we will be setting a precedent in Spokane that we are a city prepared for the future. We know what is coming, we have worked with the community to devise a variety of actions to prepare for what is coming, and we are not afraid to take it on. I want to share one of my favorite actions in the plan, WR 6.3, which is for water resources. 
says that the city should adopt a drought response plan that is tied to real-time Spokane River in-stream flows and hydrological health by April 2022 to prioritize maintaining water capacity during critical summer season. With the historic drought that the Western U.S. and Spokane experienced this summer, this is a common sense and dire need for our city. And this is just one example of over 100 actions outlined in this plan. I would echo previous comments that beyond adopting the plan, I really urge the city council to be actively engaged in implementing the plan. I also want to address previous comments by pointing out that the Sustainability Action Subcommittee was formed by a group of volunteers after Spokane's previous and current mayor refused to nominate members of the Sustainability Action Committee outlined in the 2018 Clean Energy Ordinance. Thank you for your time and please vote to adopt the Sustainability Action Plan. Thank you. And again, if Larry Luton or Patrick McCormick are there, if you want to hit star three, I'll try to get you in. We have one more speaker signed up other than you two. You're on mute. Oh, shoot. Thanks. Thanks, Trenton. And again, if um, Larry Luton or Patrick McCormick are there, if you want to hit star three. Um, we've got one more speaker signed Hello? up. Hello? Yes, who's this? Hello, this is Patrick McCormick. Can you hear me? Yes, Patrick, welcome to City Council. You Hello. Have to, you have up to three minutes. Thank you, Council President. My name is Pat McCormick, and I am a professor of religious studies at Gonzaga University, where I have taught for nearly 30 years, mostly focusing on our ethical obligations to love our neighbor and protect creation. Over this time, I have become increasingly aware not only of the scientific findings about climate change, but also of the moral and religious dimensions of a climate crisis largely caused by the rich and mostly harming the poor and God's own creation. And most painfully, I have become aware of the ways in which my generation has failed to adequately protect the generations of students who have come through my classroom in the last three decades. I wish to speak in support of the proposed sustainability action plan for three reasons. First, this August, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change stated in its sixth assessment report that it is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean, and land, that widespread and rapid changes in the atmosphere, ocean, and land have occurred. Indeed, that the weather everywhere on the planet has been affected by human-induced climate change, and that the scale of these changes to our climate system are unprecedented over many centuries to many thousands of years. This is unfortunately not news for those of us in Spokane and the surrounding area, who have been bucketed and driven indoors this summer by wildfires, smoke, unprecedented heat waves, and spreading algae blooms across our lakes. Nor is it news to local farmers and communities who have been struggling with a long-term drought. We know this climate crisis has arrived on our doorsteps. Climate change is no longer just our grandchildren's problem or a threat facing faraway people with strange sounding names. This is our climate crisis and we need to act now. Second, as a religious person, I am struck by the fact that every major world faith has now acknowledged that the climate crisis is real, that it poses a serious threat to humanity and to creation itself, that it is doing the greatest harm to the poor nations and communities and neighborhoods that have done the least to cause this unfolding catastrophe and have the fewest resources to defend themselves against it or to remediate its effects. And that our obligations to love our neighbor and care for our planet absolutely demands that we address the climate crisis and redress the injustice and harms of this human-caused crisis. Mr. McCormick. So I join with Pope Francis 
brings- and dozens of global religious leaders who have called upon everyone I- everywhere to do everything we can to address and redress this crisis. That's the end of the time we have for yes, you today. Ma'am. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you very much. And I'm going to invite Larry Luton one more time, if you're there, Mr. Luton, to hit star three. Can you hear me? Yes. Did you hit star 23 of me? Yep. Good. It's working finally. Thank you very much. Okay. My name is Larry Luton. I was a member of both Mayor Verner's Task Force on Sustainability and the Sustainability Action Subcommittee, which drafted the Sustainability Action Plan. First, I want to thank you for your support of the work of the Sustainability Action Subcommittee. If it were not for the determination and creativity of the City Council, this work would not have been possible. Second, I want to urge you to vote for this resolution. The Sustainability Action Plan will set the foundation for much needed conversations about how we can help avoid the worst possibilities of climate change. Spokane needs to not only adopt this plan, it also needs to implement large portions of it. We also need to take actions not included in this plan. Not included in this plan is a strong approach to reducing greenhouse gas emissions from methane, a greenhouse gas 84 times worse than carbon dioxide. One of the largest uses of methane is to heat buildings. Buildings account for 40% of U.S. carbon pollution. Buildings are also Washington's fastest growing carbon pollution problem by far, accounting for most of our state's emissions growth since 1990. Methane is almost as bad for the climate as coal is. Improving building codes to encourage or require electrification of our heating systems is an important step in reducing methane-related greenhouse gas emissions. It is also one of our easiest, cheapest ways to slow the climate crisis. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says that global methane emissions must be reduced by between 40 and 45 percent by 2030. The UN Environment Program says that expanding the use of methane is incompatible with keeping warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade. According to the International Energy Agency, heat pumps could satisfy 90% of global heating needs. Because the state is the proper level at which to address this problem, I'm not asking the City Council to adopt a building code that moves us toward heat pumps instead of methane furnaces. I will be requesting that the legislature take that action. I will also be asking you to join me in that request. Thank you. Thank you. And then our last speaker from the community signed up for tonight is Patty Ratcliffe. Patty, if you're there, you can hit star three. Welcome to City Council, Patty. You have up to three minutes. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, okay. Yeah, my name is Patty Ratcliffe, and I've lived in Spokane for the past 28 years. My husband and I moved here from Los Angeles in search of a healthier natural environment in which to raise our two daughters. Now grown, they have often thanked us for raising them in this beautiful place. And this year, like as many have said tonight already, but I will reiterate because it's, it's so, so um, strong an impression right now, Spokane is seeing an idyllic October with stunning displays of golds, oranges, and reds, and even some refreshing rain. But while I'm bedazzled by the beauty of this year's autumn magic, I want, and I want it to mean that Spokane is immune from the effects of climate change. I'm haunted by the persistent, vivid, vivid memory of record-breaking heat, drought, and wildfire smoke that kept me indoors and impacted the lives of everyone in Spokane this past summer and spring. 
And as much as I don't want to think about climate change, I'm forced to admit that it's, it is here in Spokane, our beautiful little town. And it's changing the way every one of us work and play, eat and live and breathe, whether we believe in it or not. With the increasing frequency of extreme weather events locally and worldwide, it has become clear that it is our responsible responsibility to take action now if future generations are to enjoy a healthy environment with economic justice and well-being for all. I'm a mother and a retired teacher in Spokane Public Schools, and I'm particularly concerned about our young people and whether they will be able to live a full and healthy life that previous generations, such as mine, have taken for granted. The term climate anxiety has become common parlance among teens and 20-somethings, many of whom express anger at adults who seem to be ignoring the glaring realities of a warming world. My 29-year-old daughter, Nanette, said recently that she envies her dad and me because we will live a full life and die, quote, before life gets to be unbearable or even unlivable on planet Earth, unquote. This shocking statement by my own daughter gave me such a kick in the gut, and more than any other reason, it is on behalf of my children and all of our children and grandchildren that I implore the city council to adopt the sustainability action plan. Climate change is an overwhelming existential challenge that can lead to hopelessness and inaction, but Spokane Sustainability Action Subcommittee has worked incredibly hard to craft a scientifically grounded roadmap for our community to respond to a changing climate in a way that makes it possible for us to intelligently and equitably create a balance among the ecological, social, and economic concerns of every person who lives here Patty, and will live here in the future. Yes. That brings us to the end of our time, time that we up. have for you. Yes. Thank, thank you for thank sharing. Thank you. Yeah. And that brings us to the end of public comment. It's now open for council commentary. Council Member Stratton. First, I want to say this was really, really good testimony tonight. It was um, wonderful to hear everybody talk about this, and even those with different opinions, um, it, it was constructive, and I enjoyed it. Um, Patrick McCormick really nailed it for me. As I was sitting here, I realized that as a parent, I have a moral obligation, we all have a moral obligation to um, leave this world or leave our world better for the next generation, for our children and our grandchildren, and do whatever we can to make sure that they have the um, the forests and the waters um, to enjoy as they raise their families and um, live their lives. When our son was little and he was tiny, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't very old, he was obsessed with, I had to write it down so I remember it, algae farms and solar panels. And he was a kid that was always experimenting and talking about these technical things. But Ben always had a side to him that was to the earth. You know, what can we do to save our planet? Um, and... He would. He kept us busy with. Uh, we built a solar oven one couple. Took us a couple of days. We built a solar oven. He made biscuits and we cooked them in the solar oven in our yard. Um, it took about 16 hours to bake those biscuits, but what a joy for all of us to see that um, he was so interested in it and it actually worked. They they did cook the biscuits. Um, he's now an adult and he has gone on to. Um, a career as a chemical engineer, and he's working on the East Coast. And right now, he is working with the green battery technology. So he has maintained that passion and that, that love for our environment. And I couldn't be more proud of him. Um, that's the generation that um, we're going to leave all of this to. And I'm um, 
I have great concern if we don't do something now, if we don't work together to get changes um, in progress, make changes, um, and really look at this issue as involving all of us, no matter what our politics are, no matter where we come from, it's, it's a human issue to me. It's not a political issue. It's human. It's there, and and we have to we have to solve this. And I I thank um, Mr. McCormick for his comments because it really brought this home to me that um, it's a human issue and it's a moral issue, and we've got to start somewhere and we've got to start now. And um, personally, thank you so much, Kara Odegaard. The work you put into this was phenomenal. I attended one of your workshops and was so um, impressed by the fact that we had all different ideas in the room, but everybody came together and had respectful, polite conversations, even though we disagreed. And that's what it's going to take for us to move all of this forward. For my son, for, for your children, for your grandchildren, for your parents, so I'm, I'm ready to get to work. I'm ready to support this. And I thank everybody for their contributions tonight. Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I guess I'll start by saying I, I appreciate how uh, accessible Kara has been throughout this and, and always being open and, and wanting to kind of hear my input and hear my concerns. Um, and I know there are some really good people that have sat on the sustainability action subcommittee. So I, I, you know, I thank them for, for their work and, and their kind of passion for, for this topic. Um, I of course have some pretty big concerns with the, the plan itself. Um, but I think just to start, I would say, I, I think the biggest issue here is, is to address, uh, you know, the, the contributions of man and the climate change is going to require, you know, so much more than the city of Spokane and anything we do, even a hundred percent is probably not even measurable globally in terms of the impact it's going to have. And so I, I, I'll start off by saying, I worry a lot about us putting a lot of policies in place that have the potential for uh, leaving us in a, a competitive disadvantage with regards to our region, our neighbors, the country. I, I worry that with, you know, those around us not necessarily following these same policies and ideas that it, it does have the potential for harming our ability to uh, uh, create and, and sustain good jobs. Um, I'm, of course, very concerned about the impact some of these policies are going to have on uh, affordable housing. And the, the cost of construction, uh, which we know, you know, every thousand dollars you increase the cost of construction. There are, you know, many, many families who are literally priced out of being able to afford uh, that, that home. And so I think right now that is the most urgent crisis uh, that we face in the city of Spokane. And uh, I will just point out, I, you know, in 2016, the city of Spokane approved an infill uh, 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 policy or a, a plan, excuse me, um, to address our infill concerns. And that plan has largely sat on a shelf and collected dust. Three months almost to the day, I think tomorrow, will be when we adopted our housing action plan. And really there has not been anything so far. I know three months isn't a lot of time, but in the middle of a crisis it is, and not a lot has happened. And so my concern is now we're gonna be adopting this plan. Where are our priority actions gonna be? Are they gonna be uh, in furtherance of policies in this plan that might make construction more expensive, that might make housing more expensive. Um, we don't know what the benefits of those policies are going to be on uh, the climate, on carbon reduction. Uh, this morning or this afternoon, I proposed three amendments to this uh, that I believe would have added transparency, uh, reasonable, uh, I think, reassurances to the community, and would have guaranteed, at least for the time being, uh, in the midst of this housing crisis that we don't face policies that will increase the cost of housing. And unfortunately, the, the, the council said no to those three concepts. Um, I think one of them would have uh, put into the plan that there is no, no expectation that we would eliminate natural gas going forward, uh, which is an affordable heating source and energy source. Um, and it, it, 
another of those uh, amendments would have uh, said that we're going to postpone any implementation of policies that will make housing more expensive. And then lastly, uh, and I think probably most importantly, and really what is, is most missing from this plan and, and that is required by code is a, a financial analysis that would look at the plan as a whole and give us some guidance as to the costs and the effectiveness of the policies. Uh, I had suggested that we create a matrix of environmental effectiveness that would allow us to compare uh, policy by policy the cost of reduction of CO2 so that we can make really good uh, prioritizations and really good decisions. Uh, the code itself also asks for the, uh, the plan to contain um, a, a, uh, an action plan to achieve the strategic goal of 100% renewable energy. And it also, uh, the code requires that the plan uh, uh, provide a, an action plan to meet or exceed city and Washington state mandated greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. And I have no doubt that some of the policies will address those, but we don't know to what extent. Will it achieve the 100% renewable? We don't know. We don't have the data to back up whether or not it will. Uh, will it reduce those uh, to meet the goals of the greenhouse gas emissions? We don't know. We don't have the data to show. And so I'm, I'm not going to be able to support this tonight, but I do believe that we need to be in good environmental stewards. We need to make really good decisions for the environment that also take into account our uh, economic stability as a city that takes into account what our regional partners uh, are also working on. And I think we also have to think about all the impacts that are around us. And right now, the biggest is the lack of supply of housing. And we have to know how this is going to impact that and whether or not it's going to increase the cost of housing on some of those in our community that are really struggling right now. So. Um, for those reasons, I, I can't support this tonight, but again, I, I, I respect and I, I appreciate the, the passion and the input of so many that have worked on this. Uh, I appreciate Kara and her accessibility and, and her desire to kind of hear my concerns and my thoughts, uh, but I just I can't get to uh, supporting this this evening. Councilmember Burke. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so first of all, I just wanted to say that um, this was one of the first ordinances that I was able to work on uh, coming into council about four years ago, and uh, it'll be one of the kind of last big votes that I get to vote on. So it's really exciting to have that full circle um, implementing this policy up front and then being able to have some sort of plan um, at the back end of my term. So I uh, just wanted to thank Kara uh, for taking this project on and being as organized as you are, but also our sustainability action um, team, the committee members who are all volunteers, all specialized in specific areas, very passionate about this uh, and, and knowledgeable and educated around these topics. And so I just wanted to thank all of you for putting in the work, putting in the effort and getting our community involved in our legislative process. I continue to get emails from you all and it means a lot to us at City Council to get those touches from our community. So um, I'm definitely going to be supporting this tonight. Uh, if, if I have one critique of it, it would be that it's not strong enough. Um, but that will always be my critique when it comes to sustainability because um, we should have been doing this yesterday. Uh, and so we're a little late, but it's better late than never. And again, I support, um, I just want to thank all of you for all of the work that you do uh, for our community, our, our, uh, the committee, and then Kara and, um, and anybody else who's been involved in this. So um, great work, everybody. And I'm uh, enthusiastically supporting it tonight. Thank you. Councilmember Kinnear. I think this is everybody loves Kara Knight, and I'm going to add because I want to recognize the immense amount of not only community collaboration that went into this plan. The Sustainability Action Subcommittee has spent hundreds of hours over the last two years studying the best practices in environmental protection, engaging with other communities that pass similar plans and creating policy recommendations to protect our local ecosystems. Kara Odegaard deserves special recognition, so we're gonna to have to give her a parade or something. 
example, facilitating the, the Spokane um, Sustainability Action Plan and shaping the plan we have before us today. This plan had the most comprehensive community engagement I've seen since the comprehensive plan, honestly. For months, if not years, everyone has had an opportunity to weigh in, both from <clears throat> our city administration and staff, public, and council. For the last few weeks, I've received hundreds of emails in support of this plan. This tells me that people are paying attention and serious about protecting our natural environment. We've heard from the opponents of the plan that this is too costly. What's the cost of losing cities to wildfires or lives to monstrous storms? What's the cost of the 20 plus lives that were lost this summer here because of extreme heat? The costs are immense and they're ones that we cannot afford. To clear up some misconceptions, there's nothing in the SAP that would limit the implementation of the Housing Action Plan or any other adopted city plan. SAP does not automatically put anything into law or practice. It sets the framework for the direction we want to see our community go. And then it asks the city to invest the adoption of policies, ordinances, practices, or funding going forward. Many of these strategies will require the city to partner with other agencies, community-based organization and others to take a collective approach to problem solving especially around transportation and watershed related issues, which I'm most interested in. The SAP is our roadmap for tackling climate change. There's much more work to do to ensure that Spokane is viable for future generations, as Councilmember Stratton said. It's, this is important for all of us. And the next step is to act. It's gonna take everyone. This cannot be just about the city enacting policy Solutions in this plan need to be adopted by all of us individually to make a difference. So I'll tell you a story now. When my husband and I were in college and him as part of a PhD program, he worked on the chimpanzee project at a ranch owned by the University of Nevada in Reno. Yesterday morning I was watching um, CBS and they were interviewing Jane Goodall. She visited the, the chimp project when we lived in Reno. She was so passionate about protecting the environment back then, particularly our chimp cousins. At 87, she's now 87, her passion is still chimpanzees, but notably it's expanded to a more urgent emphasis on climate action broadly. In the interview, Jane said, if everyone did just one thing, we could make a difference. Yes, we can. I'm elated to support this plan tonight. I'm grateful for all the community members and staff that have worked so hard to provide us with a vision for a sustainable future. For this plan to be a success, it's going to take all of us. I look forward to doing what I can to be part of the solution. So Karen, you and I are going to work for the kids. Thank you. Council Member Mum. It does matter what Spokane does. And I heard tonight that what we do here really doesn't matter on the globe. And I disagree. Um, when you look at the lives that the Spokane River touches from here all the way to the Columbia, the industries, the businesses, the people who use the water for drinking water, um, what we do here matters quite a bit. And we are the second largest city in the state of Washington. We would also be the second largest city in the state of Oregon if we were there. And uh, you just keep going. We are one of the larger mid-sized cities in all of the West Coast, and you have to go to Minneapolis on the north side of America to find a city as large as us. It also makes us competitive. Because we care about the environment and because we still have four seasons, it does matter what we do as a community and what we invest in. And it will attract new businesses. We have seen that because we are environmentally conscious and environmentally uh, working toward goals. So in order for us to be competitive and in order for us to expand and grow as a city, I think we have to adapt and change and be competitive on a national and global scale when it comes to taking care of the environment. Uh, we have some visitors in our area right now who are from Holland and they forwarded to my office an idea of what they do in Holland 
which is they have an app that tells you whether something is recyclable or not by just taking a picture of it or putting it up. So if you're sitting there sorting, you know whether your community takes or not. What a great idea. I'm going to pass it on. Those kinds of little things that we do matter and can make a huge difference. And inside the sustainability action plan, there are a lot of good ideas and little things. And I'm excited to see uh, the council work with this administration and future administrations in the implementation. I just want to address that briefly. Um, during my tenure here in the eight years, there have been many actions that the council has taken that have not been implemented that if they were, we would be further along in this. And so I don't lay the blame at this council at all for not implementing these sustainability goals because we know that that takes a staff to do it. And I know there's great staff members on the, on, in the city who are working with us and working with the mayor and her administration to move some of these things forward. But we have to have more collaboration and buy-in from this administration and future administrations if we're actually going to move the needle. And I look forward to watching that happen. Thank you. I will be supporting this. Councilmember Wilkerson. Thank you. Uh, also, thank you to Kara and this committee. When I first was appointed to council, it was one of the first committees I started sitting in on. Uh, it was a little bit over my head, but I found them to be respectful in their disagreements and would come to consensus Yes, there are many questions that are unanswered, but climate change is not stagnant. It's fluid. It's not going to stop. I have said the genies out of the bottle. We talk about climate change on a global level almost daily on the news. So we cannot ignore it and that it will not happen here. And there are costs, uh, as with everything. But I want to say... Um, from my children's, 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 that's generational in black talk, um, I do support uh, this going forward. Now, this plan does not automatically put anything into law or practice. It sets the framework for the directions we want to see our community go. So going forward, as with the council and administration, it's going to require us to partner with other agencies and community-based organizations in order to take a collective approach to solving this issue that's before us tonight. So again, I know there could be some changes. My favorite saying, unless it's death, it can be changed. So we can move forward, at least as a starting point, uh, in addressing this, so I will be supporting. Thank you. And this is a very happy night for me. I remember back in 2018 getting involved in this process, and there were two things of note that I recall back then. One was we had to decide as a council at the time whether we wanted to be very narrow in our approach and just focus on things that in city operations that only the city could control the city government, or did we want to be broader and try to come up with a plan that would be comprehensive outside of the scope of our control and even of our resources, but to put together a plan that the entire community uh, could get behind to make changes. The other significant thing that I recall from then is we wanted to do an ordinance to require 100% renewable electricity by 2030. And we quickly realized that even though the city produces uh, some electricity at its hydroelectric dam um, that's very renewable, uh, really a VISTA, our utility, is, is the key. And so I remember sitting down with the VISTA executives and working out an agreement to get to 100% renewable electricity. And that really has been the theme of this entire process, is sitting down with people who, by historical reasons might be opposed to each other. And Avista has now committed to being 100% renewable electricity, not just in Spokane, but throughout their service area. They helped with us in going to the legislature and getting the legislature to adopt similar standards for the whole state. 
And I really think that idea of people sitting down and finding common ground has been the strength of this planning process. And to go big and to go large and to have a vision for all people. And that's, that's been the strength of it. And it is probably one of the most comprehensive sustainability plans that I've seen. It's built on the shoulders of some other cities who came before. And I have no doubt that cities across the state and the region and even the nation will rely on this plan to get there. And we are at a bit of a choice because we could be at a place of fear that says, boy, if we take some steps and some short-term investments, what if people don't come along with us? We aren't the whole world, and it will take the whole world, and it will take all the cities in the world and all the countries in the world to save it. But what if they don't? and we spend some money or we get a little too far out ahead and we're less competitive in the short term. In the long term, I have no doubt that the practices we're putting it into place will make us more competitive. But I just think we have to look at the alternative. If we don't start today, really yesterday, to move forward with more sustainable practices and go big, we know what the result will be. It will be disaster and whether you're uh, 350 Spokane, or you're the intelligence agency for the entire United States. Everybody agrees. If we don't change our behavior, we will lose life as we know it. And so for me, the only option is to go forward with hope and to go forward together. So I'm thrilled to uh, vote and support this. I want to thank Kara Odegaard, who's worked so hard, and all the people that have participated from all walks of life, architects, home builders, people who are connected to the tribe, students, uh, healthcare workers, um, uh, academics, all people of faith, all different people have been involved. I thank you for your past work. I thank you for your future work. With that, let's have a roll call. Council Member Mum. Aye. Council Member Stratton. Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Aye. Council President an aye. Councilmember Burke. Aye. Councilmember Cathcart. Nay. Councilmember Wilkerson. Aye. All right. That passes six to one. And that brings us to first reading ordinances. Ordinance C36120 will be considered under hearings item H1B. Ordinance C36121 relating to the Parking Advisory Committee amending Spokane Municipal Code section 7.08.130, adding a new chapter 4.38 to Title IV, adopting new sections 4.38.010.020.030.040.040.050.060.070.080 to Chapter 4.38 of the Spokane Municipal Code and setting an effective date. Ordinance C36122 approving an amendment to the River Point Village PUD that, remove, that will remove Unit 12 from the boundaries of the PUD so that it may be developed independent of the PUD in accordance with the standards of the existing zoning regulations. The parcel number is 35173.3003 located in the city and county of Spokane, State of Washington by amending the official zoning map. Further action is deferred on the first reading ordinances. There's no requested public testimony on the first reading of ordinances, but we now are going to hearings, and there are, is some public testimony regard, regarding the hearings. H1A, hearing on vacation of Adams Street in the nearby alley between 3rd I-90 Adams and Jefferson as requested by the Volunteers of America Hope House. H1B, first reading ordinance C36120, vacating the east 55 feet of Adams Street from the south line of 3rd Avenue to the north line of I-90 together with the alley between 3rd Avenue and I-90 from the east line of Adams Street to the west line of Jefferson Street. Further action is deferred on the first reading ordinance. And we have one member of the public who wants to testify on this vacation, but um, Eldon Brown, if you'd like to just um, give us a quick summary of what this vacation would do, and then after that, I'll invite Nicolette Ockeltree to hit star three. Yeah, good evening, Council. I'll see if I can share my screen here. Looks like I have the same problem Minga did there. I'm getting the whiteboard things all I can see.
while you're working on that, I just wanted to mention, I believe um, Steve Coffey also wants to testify on this. So if you're listening, Steve, we haven't forgotten you. And comes President. Oh, no, Eldon's ready. Go ahead, Eldon. Yeah, I think I got it shown here. Basically, this vacation is to vacate the remaining 55 feet of Adams Street from 3rd Avenue south to the I-90 right away, and then the alley between Adams Street and Jefferson between 3rd and 990. The applicants are really trying to control access and provide aid and some security as part of this vacation. And there are a lot of utilities in the alley and also in the actual streets. So we did have a lot of input from our utility purveyors about making sure if they are vacated, we retain easements. In there we had a Vista, West Dot, City of Spokane, a lot of different purveyors in there that have facilities in both the alley and in the streets. And then another issue that did pop up on Adams Street is today we have 55 feet there that's being considered for vacation on the west side of that roadway. Today there's uh, we're trying to uh, control parking. There's no parking signs up on that side of the street. And if this vacation is approved, we need to make sure that there's an actual easement or an agreement, I should say, established between property owners in there that would actually uh, control that parking and they're basically not allowed on that west side for the businesses to stay viable on the east side. So those are just a couple of things that popped up here. But from a staff perspective, we would recommend vacation subject to conditions. And one other condition that did pop up was it has been requested to be a no-cost vacation by the applicants. So staff would support the uh, vacation of these, both the alley and the street subject to conditions. Be happy to answer any questions. Any questions from council for Eldon? All right, not seeing or hearing any. Thank you, Eldon. Oh, wait, Councilmember Burke. I'm sorry, I do have a question. Eldon, is this going to be at the cost to VOA or are we waiving that fee? I can't remember. Yeah, the request was to waive the fees period for this vacation on both the alley and the street. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, and like I mentioned, I think we have two members of the public, Nicolette Ockeltree, if you want to hit star three, and after Nicolette, um, Steve Coffey. Welcome to City Council, Nicolette. You have up to three minutes. Good evening again, Council. Um, yes, one of my first questions I initially had was what the need was uh, for this vacation. But I believe that um, Eldon Brown just answered that question, that it's in part due to the need to shore up security. Um, I do wonder whether or not perhaps they should try to figure out whether or not all the stakeholders and all these various conditions that have come up are resolved before moving on this or approving it, uh, since there seem to be a lot of uh, complexities with respect to the sewers and fiber infrastructure that were there and then the, the parking situation that he was talking about. Um, and then in general, you know, for, for this in, in particular, the no-cost vacation would be $347,000 if they had been charging. And uh, I can see that keeping the VOA, you know, safe is going to be in our best interest. However, there's just this sort of question about how often we make these no-cost vacations. And really, um, I think that in this case, we need to make sure we're weighing all of the, uh, again, all the other um, costs that may be hidden within this. Uh, for example, if we do have to, um, you know, construct certain kinds of other uh, ways for people to park and then also other access points for utilities, there's a question as to whether or not um, that $347,000 amount would really be the total cost of, uh, bringing all those conditions into compliance to make that vacation um, the right way to go. So anyway, thank you for your time. Thank you. And then I'd like to invite Steve Coffey, if you're there, to hit star three. All right. Steve, welcome to City Council. You have up to three minutes. Yeah, my name is Steve Coffey, and um, my wife and I are the owners of the building to the east on bordering Adams Street in the app. Um, there's quite a few issues with parking and access. Uh, since uh, the building was built, uh, VOA's building, 
why we've had innumerable problems with parking and uh, even the no parking that exists on the west side of the Adams Street is uh, consistently violated. We have fire trucks that pull down there, and then that impacts us. We've wound up 24-7. We use this building. It's automotive-oriented, and uh, we wind up with our driveways blocked, our back parking lots blocked, our back access to our employee parking blocked. Uh, so we need to be able to control this and to keep access in the street. Sometimes the whole street is parked. Uh, blocked with parked cars uh, uh, with people that are either visiting or actually are staying in the shelter. So we've had severe problems trying to even access our facility, and we need to be able to control this and keep the garbage down and problems that come along with that. So I just would like to encourage you to go with this uh, so that, we can kind of clean the problem all up and be able to access this building because it impacts se severely the business in there, and uh, we also use it as owners. And so it really, really does hamper us, and we many times are unable to even access the building. Uh, we've been challenged by some of the homeless people with their cars uh, telling us we don't have any right to even use our driveways. So anyway, just... I would like to just say that it would really encourage being able to control this and kind of clean it up, and we're able to police it. Currently, the city is, you know, not available on Sundays, nights, uh, evenings, and uh, even on a delayed basis. We show up, and it takes quite some time for the city to even come down to write a ticket for them. So it's just uh, quite a few problems that come up that we'd like to be able to control this and be able to clean this uh, situation up and by the way, there's a, uh, considered a 20-foot easement on the west side of that for utilities, fire, police, et cetera, down that street. And this is all part of the conditions of the uh, vacation. So we would really like to encourage you to support this vacation. So I just wanted to make that clear. Thank you. Thank you. Any council commentary? All right. Councilmember Mum. Yeah, it sounds like this is a good resolution to a problem and I support it. I just also want to put out there, we did pass a driveway ordinance several years ago to protect business owners. So you should have rights in your driveway and some uh, may not be aware of that. So uh, you can invoke that in the future. Yeah. All right. Any other comments from council? Councilmember Wilkerson. I support this too, and I really appreciate uh, the business owners showing up and expressing their concerns and being willing to work with VOA um, collaboratively to, to address these issues, but also knowing the services that they provide and how important it is. So I look forward to subject of conditions uh, being met in the best interest of everyone. All right, I think we're ready for a roll call. Councilmember Mum. Aye. Councilmember Stratton. Aye. Councilmember Kinnear. Aye. Council President Sinai, Councilmember Burke. Aye. Councilmember Cathcart. Aye. Councilmember Wilkerson. Aye. Okay, that passes seven to zero subject to conditions. That brings us to the next hearing. Hearing item H2, final reading ordinance C36116 relating to stormwater facilities, amending Spokane Municipal Code section 17D.060.030.050.140.140.1, or excuse me, 17D.090.030.070.110.210.210.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0
Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, if, if not for, for one provision here, I would be voting yes. Uh, E1, I just think, is uh, an unfair burden that we're putting on property owners. And uh, if, if this were to be modified to where it would uh, not take place until perhaps the, the property were to change hands at the next point in time, or uh, even if the city were to provide for uh, the annual, um, uh, uh, the, the uh, what's the term I'm looking for, the, the maintenance, the annual maintenance inspection, uh, then I would be fully supportive of this. But because of that burden that we're putting on, on property owners to do this after the fact, uh, I just can't support it tonight. Any other council commentary? Yeah, I just, I wanted to add that I would, I think we have to get in compliance and so we have to get this in place, but I would encourage the administration to look at the option of um, hiring inspectors and then passing on the actual costs to the property owners that might be cheaper for them uh, than having to hire their own people. I'm not sure if that would be or not, um, but I would, I think it'd be great for the administration to explore that as an option. But for the time being, we really need to get the, into stormwater compliance and there's plenty of stormwater facilities that are not maintained that are really degrading our uh, groundwater and river water. So I think we need to take care of business in terms of clean water, but I would certainly be open to that. Um, if there are no other council commentary. We'll have a roll call. Council Member Mum. Aye. Council Member Stratton. Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Aye. Council Presidents and I. Council Member Burke. Aye. Council Member Cathcart. Nay. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. Okay, and that passes six to one. That brings us to hearing number three. H3, final reading ordinance C36117 relating to administration definitions amending Spokane Municipal Code section 17A.020.010.020.040.06.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0
Um, it shows it slowly loading. I'm not sure if you see that oh, as well. We see it now. We got it. Okay. Thank you very much. I will uh, turn my video off to save some bandwidth here, and we'll get into the presentation. Uh, so again, thank you, uh, Council President and Council Members. I'm here uh, to present the revenue sources for the 2022 budget as required by RCW 8455-120. Again, my name is Paul and Josie. Pause for applause. And I'm the Director of Management and Budget for the city. I can advance the slides. I will show you uh, that we are going to uh, take a look at the schedule for the 2022 proposed budget, provide an overview of the general fund revenue you can expect to see in that proposed budget, and then finally take a closer look at the tax revenue details for 2022, along with some historical trends. Uh, also at the top, I wanted to uh, specifically thank City Council staff, uh, Matt Boston and Tim Donovan. Uh, we were able to meet several times over the last few months to review and compare revenue projections for 2021 and 2022, and I appreciate their insight and expertise. As you're aware, the mayor will release her 2022 proposed budget next Monday, November 1st, 2021. That will be followed by several public budget meetings and hearings beginning on November 8th, continuing through December 6th, uh, 2021 as well. Also on the calendar for November is the property tax ordinance set to set the 2022 levy rates, as well as the six year capital improvement program ordinance. This first slide compares general fund revenue from the 2021 adopted budget with what you can expect to see in the 2022 proposed budget next week. The 2022 proposed budget is a 4% increase above the 2021 adopted. And you'll note the revenue of the 2022 proposed is an increase of approximately $300,000 over the 2022 preliminary budget from the beginning of October. Again, you can see the tax revenue makes up approximately 82% of 2022 revenue with retail sales and use tax being the largest piece of that pie. This slide shows 2022 proposed compared to 2020 actuals and 2021 budget. Uh, again, the 2020 actuals do not include the nearly $8 million in CARES dollars, just to give you a strict or more clean uh, apples to apples comparison. Now we'll move into specific general fund revenue types. First up is property tax, which as mentioned, uh, the ordinance will be before council on November 8th to set the levies for 2022. By law, local governments are allowed to increase the amount raised by the levy by 1% or inflation, whichever is less. For 2021 through 2022, that inflation rate was 3.86%, so we'll be capped at the 1% for 2022. That equals approximately $635,000 in the regular levy. Uh, the city has four levies, the regular, the fire EMS, public safety personnel, and the general obligation bond levies. Uh, the 1%, uh, as mentioned, uh, $635,000, what's uh, included in the budget is actually a $1.5 million increase. And as you remember, uh, you can include new construction improvements and prior year refunds in that amount. So that's how you can increase it by what ends up calculating to be 2.4% instead of 1%. The 2022 proposed budget will include $90.2 million in property tax revenue across all of those levies. Uh, you can see here approximately 72% is expected to go towards the city regular levy or $65 million. Approximately 10% for fire EMS, 7% for public safety levy, and 11% for the general obligation bonds. Also at the bottom right, uh, you can see the anticipated levy rate for 2022 is around 3.618 for $1,000, whereas 2021 was 3.697. This slide shows potential taxpayer impacts based on the updated levy rate. First table assumes what the impact of the taxpayer would be if property values all grew at the same rate, and the bottom table if uh, property values did not increase. And when you're thinking of what the impact of the taxpayer would be, if you think of it as a fraction, once the uh, denominator increases uh, from the uh, assessed value of the city growing, if your numerator stays the same, you're, you're gonna pay less. So that's what that bottom table shows. But if you're uh, if your uh, property tax or your, or your property value increases, your numerator will increase. So your 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 impact is going to be uh, slightly larger as well. This graph uh, here plots the percent change in regular property tax revenue over the last 10 years. You can see specific increases where bank capacity, the street levy, and the public safety levy were implemented. 
And to the far right, you can see the 2.4% increase for 2022. This uh, graph uh, shows the actual revenue received again over that last 10 year period as well. Uh, next up will be sales tax. So I'll pause here if there are any questions. If not, we'll plow ahead. Okay. Uh, sales tax, which is the um, largest. Council, Council Member Mom had a question. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah, I, we're showing um, changes from the budgeted 2021 to 2022, but um, maybe at some point we're talking about sales tax. How close were we to those projections? Um, would be important, I think, for the, the public to know. Sure. Uh, we don't have that in this, but I know we can we can get that information for you and make sure it's available. Uh, so sales tax, again, largest general fund revenue site for 2022. We're projecting a 15% increase over the adopted budget, but only 1% over 2021 estimates. And uh, once we get into the sales tax, we'll take a quick look at what makes up the city sales tax, and we'll do, uh, have a similar view of the local option sales tax as similar to the property tax with percent change in actual revenue. So this table shows the city's sales tax is now at 9%, 6.5% of which goes to the state of Washington. The city's 1% local option sales, ta sales and use taxes here, as is, as is the newest one-tenth percent sales tax for affordable housing uh, at the bottom of this table. Again, uh, showing the percent change of sales tax revenue 2021 uh, on this table is actually the estimated base on actuals through 20, September 2021. So uh, as 2020 dipped and you see a 3.5% decrease, 2021 really nowhere to go but up. Uh, so based on our projections, we're seeing about 22.5% uh, higher uh, for 2021 in actuals which makes our increase for 2022, even though it looks great compared to prior years, uh, looks like only a 1% increase when you compare it to our 2021 estimated numbers. Uh, we've shown versions of this slide in the past, uh, most recently, I think at one of the budget workshops. This assumes a 3% baseline growth just in the local option sales tax over the last 20 years. Uh, and that is the uh, represented by the orange line. And then the blue represents actual revenue, which is then again updated for 2021 estimates and 2020 proposed. So you can see the sharp increase um, compared to uh, 2020, where it dips down. Uh, so long term for the last 20 years, we would have anticipated to be around that $51 mark for 2021. But with the, the strong tax receipts and taxable sales we've seen, we're going to be closer to that, that upper range, uh, the high 50s uh, for uh, 2021. The uh, third leg of the stool is the utility tax group, which includes both pro private and public. Uh, you can see here private utilities are projected to decrease 2.8% from the adopted, but again, increase almost 1% from 2021 estimates. And so the utility taxes are anticipated to increase 3.5% above the adopted budget, but 3.8% above 2021 estimates. And part of that is going to be due to the uh, uh, uncollectible revenue or uncollected revenue uh, related to the pandemic or, that we saw over the last uh, 18 months or so. Again, when we're talking about utility taxes, we include electric, natural gas, telephone, cable, and then a small piece, I believe, of solid waste, too. Uh, and city utilities include water, sewer, storm water, integrated capital, and solid waste. Graphing the private utility percent changes for uh, revenue, uh, again, all over the place for the last 10 years. The increase for 2021 is primarily a function of how negative 2020 finished. Uh, really, there again, nowhere to go but up for 2021 compared to 2020. Uh, looking at it in dollars, in the mid-20s, uh, 20 million for the last uh, 10 years or so, the, uh, the, the category we're actually seeing a continual decrease uh, over the last couple of years is in telephone taxes, which makes sense as uh, people are foregoing landlines and, again, signing up more for uh, cell phones and cell phone plans. Uh, here's the city utility percent change. You can see the decrease again in 2020 primarily due to the pandemic, with a similar rebound as private utilities for 2021. And then uh, graphing the city utility tax revenue over the 10-year period, 
with our two per, generally 2.9% uh, rate increase built in, along with uh, net changes to uh, customer base and um, uh, revenue collected. So up, upward swing over the last 10 years for city utility taxes. Uh, that concludes my presentation. Again, we look forward to delivering the mayor's 2022 proposed budget next Monday. I'm happy to take any questions either now or you can email uh, us at budget at spokanecity.org. Thank you. Any questions for Paul? Um, we do have one requested community commenter, uh, but before that, Paul, it says on my agenda that we're looking for a council decision. Is is that just to close the hearing or is there some other action? Close the hearing. Just to close the hearing, okay. Uh, I believe just to close the hearing, this is just the revenue hearing okay. uh, for 2022 and then this uh, will serve to inform the, the property tax will be coming forward in November as well. Okay, great. Um, if there are no questions from council members, then I'm gonna invite Nicolette Ockletree to Hit star three. All right, welcome back to City Council Nicolette. You have up to three minutes. This is Mercy. Oh. See the slides, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Welcome, you've got up to three minutes. <laughs> okay. Yes, uh, it was a little bit hard to follow along since uh, I couldn't actually see any of the slides that he referred to. Um, uh, but I do hope that we're focusing on more clever and nuanced uh, revenue sources that will be considered rather than just uh, raising taxes. I will review the relevant sections of the budget, uh, but hope to see some of the following things considered as possible revenue sources. For example, tightening the enforcement of Airbnbs paying hotel taxes. It seems the number of Airbnbs and short-term rentals are increasing, but it's unclear if anything is being done to ensure that they are paying their fair share of the hotel's tax. Um, also, tightening up enforcement of business licenses, including but not limited to ensuring that landlords have appropriate business licenses. I can understand not wanting to add any undue financial burden on new businesses, but considering that council last week passed a lower rate for new business uh, for new businesses acquiring licenses, I believe it was a 50% discount through the end of next year. Uh, it seems to me to be the best time to ensure that those businesses operating in Spokane are in compliance, and if not that they, any need for a new application for a business uh, license is completed as soon as possible, since it will be cheaper now than in the distant future. Uh, I'd also like to point out that uh, sometimes increasing revenue can be achieved by being smarter at how we spend our money and utilize our resources. So critically thinking about the best way to resolve the over $6 million owed by citizens and businesses for the uh, city waste and water and city utilities, I heard at the budget meeting on Friday that once the moratorium on those owed amounts is lifted, that the city will then activate, uh, potentially activate a firm they've previously hired to make collections on those claims. Uh, I don't have all the numbers in front of me, so I can't do a thorough cost-benefit analysis, but depending on how much money and city resources uh, is spent on collecting these past due amounts, I wonder if it would be worth wiping that six, over $6 million in debt completely free. If some households are owing several thousands of dollars, it's likely that they may qualify for assistance in paying those debts. But again, um, how much is being spent on distributing those funds and managing the applications and approval process? Is it possible that by clearing those debts across the board, time, money, and resources could be freed up for better purposes? Is it possible that sales tax would be increased by folks having more money to spend instead of trying to save up to chip away those past due utility bills. Sometimes we have to work smarter, not harder, to tackle tough budgetary issues. Thank you for your time. Thank you. That brings us to the end of public comment on the revenue hearing. I'm looking for a motion to close the 2022 budget revenue hearing. So moved. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor of closing the hearing indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Any abstentions? All right. The hearing is now closed. That brings us to open forum. And 
I have four people signed up for open forum, I believe. Uh, James E. to talk about homelessness, Nicolette Ockeltree, City Affairs, Elizabeth Williams, Air Quality, and then Mercy Aguilar. So, James E., if you're there, if you want to hit star three. James, is that you? Yes, I'm here. All right. Welcome to City Council. You have up to three minutes. Hello. Um, so, yes, I'm going to speak about homeless, but also I want to get to rental registry and rent control in Spokane because it is a big contributing factor to homeless. Without it, it is kind of where we're at right now currently. Um, rent control means we can... Landlords can be held accountable, but also it would be a resource for um, tenants to go to. Rather than go through apartments and all that, we can know what the landlord is like. Um, we'll have a history of it. And also, this may be making business with doing landlords easier as well. And what I mean by easier is we don't have to worry about uh, doing business transactions. Uh, we don't have to worry about all the paperwork involved from a private, uh, from a business entity to a private, um, to a private per or to a landlord. So they will cut that paperwork out. Um, and also, there's an article which now this kind of pertains to the homeless part. There's an article out there that uh, it, the way it was done is concerning, that there's Sheldon Jackson who goes around and drives every day and gets data about homeless encampments. So now my question is what does city count, what does the city do with those numbers every day that they provide. Also, are they really providing a service? Do they have an Arcan kit? Are they aware of trafficking? Um, are they, is, they may see it as enabling, but are they at least able to provide any form of service to, if something were to happen, where than just drive by and let it happen? That's what's concerning. Uh, because they're, uh, if they're just driving around, then what are they doing really besides giving the data back to you? Um, to me, that kind of sounds like stalking. Like you're stalking homeless encampments, you're driving around and not doing like anything really beyond just providing information. So, what does the city of Spokane do with the information that they provide? Because that's a lot. And are they all, do they also volunteer themselves on the point in time count? Because again, they're out there giving information as well. That's all I have to say about that. All right, thanks so much, James. Have a good night. It's good to hear from you again. Um, Nicolette Ockeltree, if you'd like to hit star three. Welcome back, Nicolette. You have up to three minutes. Thank you again, Council President Beggs, and thank you again, Council. The Public Records Act declares, among other things, the people of the state do not yield their sovereignty to the agencies that serve them. The people in delegating authority do not give their public servants the right to decide what is good for the people to know and what is not good for them to know. The people insist on remaining informed so that they may maintain control over the instruments they have created. Furthermore, courts shall take into account the policy of the Public Records Act that free and open examination of public records is in the public's interest, even though such examination may cause inconvenience or embarrassment to public officials or others. 
I am of the opinion that no one should ever feel intimidated or bullied when they make a public records request. However, I did not feel that way today. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And then Elizabeth Williams, if you'd like to hit star three. Welcome to City Council, Elizabeth. You have up to three minutes. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, I've been air quality, and I was actually going planning to speak about the sustainability action plan, but I, uh, I just wanted to thank the Council Vote 6 to 1 to approve that. And uh, just to give one little perspective here, I work in healthcare um, in a care center. And I've just seen the correlation between the air quality with the wildfires, COVID-19, and then the racial inequities uh, where pollution is located in cities and such, and, you know, the vulnerable people. And I work in recreation therapy, so we have often taken the residents and patients outside to get some fresh air, but then, you know, with the wildfire smoke, we couldn't do that. And then we had to really be aware of not having them near certain other people because of COVID. And so it was a really hard time for them. And I just want people to be aware that um, I really think that the air quality issues um, that the sustainability you know, plan addresses are just very, very important. And it really just um, was so evident in the last year and a half with COVID going on and, and the wildfire smoke and such, because it really isolated a lot of these elderly people and the most vulnerable in our community. So um, along with what some of the others were talking about, um, the methane emissions and such, um, yeah, I see that as a focal point for this um, plan, but I'm really impressed with all that was on it and um, how broad it is in all the different areas. So I'm part of the 50 Spokane, and I'm also uh, part of United Methodist Creation Justice uh, Care Network for United Methodist Church across the nation. And so I'm really looking forward to sharing some of the ideas in the Sustainable Life Plan with United Methodists from across the nation um, and helping other communities do some of what um, is recommended in the plan here. Okay, because I think a lot of it can be applied other places. So thank you for your time. Thank you. And then um, Mercy Aguilar, if you're there, you want to hit star three? All right, welcome back, Mercy. You have up to three minutes to share with us this evening. Thank you, City Council President Biggs. Uh, my concern is that uh, we need a lot more garbage cans downtown for the, the masks for the garbage. And um, I noticed there was something in the agenda today saying that downtown police and STA need better security. What are they trying, or what type of security is it that they're needing? Because treating people with humane treatment seems to work pretty, pretty well. Um, this is my sixth year now coming to the city um, about the houseless, and it's winter time again. Um, it's getting very cold, and I see this. I see a lot of the same faces still waiting for emergency housing, and. Um, in regards to the, the climate action that, that we need in our city, if we have this many people right now houseless, we can't even take care of all of them in a proper manner when it's just a week or two of intense heat. How are we going to do it if there is a fire that comes through our city? What if it comes through the valley? We have all those people. What if it comes through our neighboring um, uh, Idaho, those people over there 
if they're not making provisions for themselves, that's going to leave, leave us just like it has with COVID. Our hospitals are now full of their patients. Why are our police and fire um, uh, personnel not mandated to wear proper PPE when they are engaged with the public? It is no different than if they were smoking a cigarette right in front of an elderly person who can't be around that. It, I am blown away that, that they're say, trying to go on strike, but yet we are paying their health care and their future retirement benefits out of our tax dollars, and they want that, but they are not willing to take care of themselves and our community, and I think there should be consequences, and I hope that city council members hold them accountable. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that brings us to the end of all of our business this evening. Um, please take care of yourself, and if you can, take care of someone else. We are adjourned.